Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the U.S. EPA Mid-Atlantic Region 2024 Virtual Summit. Before we begin, we have a couple of housekeeping announcements. Please keep your questions for the panelists in the Q&A box located on the control panel. If you're having any technical difficulties with Zoom, please send the chat message to IT support and we'll reach out to you as soon as possible. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the EPA Region 3 website once it's ready. And with this, I would like to turn it over to Regional Administrator Adam Ortiz. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you had a chance to grab some lunch or at least some snacks or leftovers from the fridge if you're working from home. Um, you know, we structured today because we know you're busy. Uh, we know you have uh, work days, activism, families. So, you know, punch in and out as you need to today. Um, that's one of the beauties of having a virtual summit is you can tune in when you can, and if you can't, um, no worries. We're recording everything and we'll email it to you uh, so you can catch up on stuff you missed or go back to things um, that you wanna hear again. Um, so speaking of uh, this morning in our uh, opening session uh, with, uh, with Tom Perez from the White House and from Janet McCabe from EPA headquarters, um, and then uh, the following uh, session with the state secretaries and uh, DC Director of the Environment, uh, 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 Richard, um, we weren't able to get to your questions um, just because that we all had so much to say, but um, we always want to be responsive and we appreciate your engagement. So we will answer those questions. And for the ones that were directed to one of the speakers, we'll pass the questions on to them. And then when we uh, send you the clips of the videos and the links, uh, we'll also include responses to those questions. So thank you for understanding and thanks for being patient. Um, also, we have, um, as you know, as you know by now, just a tremendous mix of presenters today, and that's intentional. You know, we have scientists, professors, advocates, community leaders, mayors, meteorologists, plural meteorologists, um, and musicians. And um, like I said, that's intentional. We do that on purpose, and it's important because you know the work of the environment, as Tom Perez said this morning, is very much intersectional. You know, it's ecological, it's scientific, but it's also historical, social, and cultural. And as the secretaries um, said, especially Richard Jackson from DC, really made a point that how important it is to engage with people, the public, where they are. We don't want to speak over people's heads. And, you know, there's lots of cultural communities um, as well as geographical communities in our region. So we have to be really thoughtful about how we engage and try to engage as many people as possible as many ways as possible. And this is personal to me um, because as a young person, I didn't do a great job listening to my parents or my teachers, but I did listen to the musicians that I followed, um, whether it was on CDs and cassette tapes, um, I admit that, um, or in Rolling Stone. I didn't read Newsweek or the New York Times, but I did religiously read Rolling Stone and it had a big impact on me as a young person, which has helped shape me into the person I am today. So there's lots of ways to engage and empower people. And that's you know, why I'm really excited about um, this next session. And I just wanna provide a little bit of context before I hand it off to our team to do um, uh, more full introductions. Um, I had the, the pleasure of spending time with somebody who I admire uh, a year and a half ago at EPA headquarters, um, singer songwriter, um, and I would say philosopher <laughs> and, and cultural a commentator, um, Dar Williams, uh, came to EPA headquarters and provided a little bit of a performance and, and a talk about her perspective on the work uh, uh, that we're all doing together on team environment, uh, which I thought was very powerful. And it really made a lot of sense. And uh, Dar is also an author. Uh, she wrote um, a book uh, titled, What I Found in a Thousand Towns, A Traveling Musician's Guide to Rebuilding America's Communities, One Coffee Shop, Dog Run, and Open Mic Night at a Time. And I think that that kind of perspective uh, on the ground, and as many of you know, we spend a lot of time in uh, small towns and, and cities engaging with people and you know, showing up on Main Street, going out to the diner and to the coffee shop and not the chain restaurant when we can avoid it to connect with real people and get the vibe um, because that's how we lead to true transformation. So I was really excited that Dar uh, agreed to come back and speak with us today. And also I had the pleasure years and years ago of um, being uh, on a panel uh, and spending time with Reverend Yearwood uh, from the Hip Hop Caucus. This was when I was um, director of the environment in Prince George's County um, to the east of Washington, DC, uh, really trying to engage uh, a, broad, um, a, a broad swath 
uh, of, uh, of our community, especially younger people and people of color. And I was just, uh, I just found uh, the perspective of the Hip Hop Caucus so, so powerful, so thoughtful, so impactful, and just uh, so, so the way that um, they blend speaking to social justice activism and expression as part of social responsibility in the, in the agency that we all have in making a difference. I just found that so powerful. So I'm really, really excited to also include them. And um, you, know, you might think, oh, folk singer and you know, folks from the hip hop community, you know, very different, but I say no. I think, uh, you know, same conversation, um, maybe different perspectives, um, but everybody's working together on team environment. So I'm really excited to hear from Russell Armstrong and to pass it off and to, to, to introduce uh, the next session in earnest, uh, led by our own Patrick Beckley, who's our state liaison for Virginia. So Patrick, over to you. Thanks a lot, Adam. Um, we appreciate the, the opening words. And it's a pleasure to have Dar and Russell on today, as well, as well as our fearless leader, Gail Scott, for the Office of Public Affairs. Um, just a bit of agenda for today. We're going to go through um, introductions and then a few questions and open it up to the audience um, for any questions you may have. So for the first introduction, Dar Williams is an acclaimed song um, singer, songwriter with over 25 years of experience, known for optimistic lyrics and captivating melodies. We just heard um, one of her songs, Hudson, play before this session started. Um, she believes in the power of uh, individuals to achieve, and she's influenced by a diverse range of music backgrounds. So this should be a really um, engaging conversation. Uh, Gail. Okay, guys. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gail Scott, Director of, of Public Affairs. And um, first of all, a shout out. Thank you for the over 400 participants um, that are, are here right now. So I wanted the panel to know that we got over 400 folks listening. Um, but I am honored and excited to uh, introduce and welcome Russell Armstrong, who is the Policy Director for Climate and Environment at the Hip Hop Caucus, which is our, what they connect to is the hip hop community to help messaging, focusing on climate justice and environmental justice and advocates for marginalized communities impacted by climate change. Um, Russell has extensive experience in federal and state policy, which makes him perfect for understanding, you know, how to get to search certain audiences with sometimes what we have with a stiff policy that nobody quite understands. Um, he is, holds several degrees, um, uh, the American University, uh, Washington College of Law, Loyal University, Chicago, my hometown, and the esteemed University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Russell, and uh, I, let's get this Let's get this party started. Okay, Patrick. Thanks, Gail. Um, yeah, definitely. Let's roll into the first question. So, this one would be for Dar, and we really appreciate your time um, today. Um, so, your music often touches on themes of nature, community, and social change. How do you see the role of art in, in storytelling and raising awareness about environmental justice um, issues, as well as amplifying marginal voices? Um, you know, a lot of emphasis is put on specific songs. Um, you know, Adam talked about how, the, you know, he listened to those lyrics when he wasn't necessarily listening to his parents. And I think that's enormous. Like, I think that that's poetry is kind of how I like big ideas get in. The music kind of massages it into the brains of teenagers at a really formative time and, and shows them that the world is bigger than, you know, just getting from point A to point B and like, even competition and things like that. So I, I love that power of music and I see people sort of softening in the audiences into either that memory of their more idealized self um, or of, of remembering sort of what those larger values are. So I never wanna minimize that power of in the moment of lyrics. Um, and also, you know, I'm imagining for Russell, like it, they help us translate things into our everyday experience. You know, when Gail talks about policy being kind of dense, you know, the poetry and lyrics can kind of translate things for one another and for ourselves. Um, I also, as a traveling musician, um, have just seen how, uh, how formative, how important uh, and, and generative it is for places to 
not only have people like me coming through their stages, but to like really put the time into building those stages and those organizations that present culture and that use those physical places and those that, that ethos to um, create teaching, learning cultures within their towns. So open mics, um, lessons, uh, things like lessons for people who are not teenagers who, who you know, say, I, no one asked me if I wanted to write a memoir. Indeed, I do want to write a memoir. You know, I think um, cultural institutions that encourage us to find our own poetic way of thinking of things um, and that build in that not only generate a lot of creative solutional energy in communities, but they also create that sense in themselves. Like, look at this cultural thing that we're a part of. Even if I make the poster, or I make the brownies. You know, I've watched people just being um, uh, feeling like their lives are fuller, more solutional, and more uh, and better for the whole environment, you know, our ecosystem, when they're part of um, a, a cultural ethos in their in their towns. So, um, so I always want to put that in the equation of the the power of music. Yeah, definitely, that was a great answer. And you mentioned yeah. being a traveling uh, musician. You're currently on tour now, correct? I'm, I'm home. <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I got home two days ago, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Just just checking to make sure we get a plug in on that. But um, next I'm going to be introducing a short trailer um, from the Hip Hop Caucus, which is a nonprofit that brings the hip hop community in, in, into advocacy. Um, um, this short project is called Underwater Projects, um, which is focusing on the Hampton Roads community. And it's um, going to be in essence music um, movie fest coming up this summer. So definitely be on the lookout for this. Um, if you hit play, please. I believe that the Hampton Roads Norfolk can be the place of solution. Yes, you're ground zero. Yes, you're in harm's way. But yes, you can be the solution to the rest of the country and the world to fix this climate crisis. Norfolk is one of the top three areas in the country vulnerable to sea level rise and coastal flooding. People that live here, this happens almost almost daily. Hampton Roads is a way of defining at least seven cities, and so we're one big, big family. Between the HBCUs that are here, the largest naval base in the world, they all come together here. That's what I love about this area. This is a beautiful place, but... We've lost homes, we've lost property, we've lost people. The St. Paul's Development Project is a major concern for me. Over 7,000 black residents being displaced. How are we the ones being hurt the worst by a climate crisis that we contribute to the least? You spend your life breathing in bad air, drinking bad water. My God, that is exactly what is happening in every one of our neighborhoods. Black folks have a lot to worry about, but this is an issue that affects us more than everybody else. Every day when I come in, I think about a hurricane. In a minute, it can all be swept away. We, we gotta figure this out. There's, we don't have any other choice but to figure this out for our future. Okay, so that trailer speaks truth. Congratulations, Russell, on being entered into the Essence uh, Festival in July. And um, I think that's great. Uh, it's a good way to get the messaging out there and understand that you have Wanda Sykes as a narrator, who's one of my favorite folks and is from our area. So here's my question for you. As the policy, policy director for the climate environment at the Hip Hop Caucus, What's, what are specific policies or initiatives that you're currently advocating for to ensure greater equity and representation in environmental decision making? So no, I'm glad I no, thanks for that, Gail. <clears throat> First, I just want to say um, thank you all for having us at the Hip Hop Caucus. Appreciate the introduction also from Adam and his time meeting with Rev Yearwood, who's our president and CEO. And, you know, it's interesting that we're doing underwater projects as our latest documentary that uh, we're featuring that was also in the DC Environmental Film Festival, in addition to just being entered into 
uh, the Essence Film Festival as well for this July. So, you know, that took a lot of our team. There's actually a labor of love that happened, was filmed years ago. Parts of it were filmed before the pandemic and featuring uh, locals from the Hampton Roads area speaking to some of those issues. And I can talk more about that later. But so to specifically answer your question, and as the actual now senior director over all of our campaigns and advocacy, we have a team that's built out on environmental justice. One of the things that we're doing is trying to amplify environmental justice champions on Capitol Hill and connecting them with environmental justice leaders who've been doing this work for years uh, in the field. People like Melissa Miles from the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, um, folks like Dr. Nikki Sheets and Anna Baptiste from the Tishman Center, um, people like Dr. Bullard, um, and you know, talking about issues in terms of engagement and more fulfilling engagement, all, all with environmental justice leaders on the ground. And pieces of legislation that do that on Capitol Hill on the federal level was things like the Environmental Justice for All Act, which was actually first introduced by the late representative from Virginia, Donald A. McEachin, A. Donald McEachin, who we've uh, gotten the blessing of to do our annual environmental justice honors in his name. Um, that award is features and tries to uplift uh, environmental justice champions on Capitol Hill, who are doing the work of trying to push for increased engagement with communities. Some of that engagement that needs to happen is, you know, seen in NEPA, which is the you know National Environmental Policy Act. It is seen in uh, regulatory happenings that are going on right now, such as within the power plant rule. In fact, the existing there's a uh, events happening tomorrow at EPA headquarters where some of our environmental justice champions will be speaking on panels, uh, speaking to the need for one greater engagement and some of their concerns around uh, policy issues on you know gas turbines in the EPA rulemaking that's uh, being put forth and speaking to that. Um, whether it's also at the Department of Energy and the public interest determination, our representation on the environmental justice uh, round table that happened over a year ago at FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. There's a through line that you see in all of these things, which is that while engagement is happening and has been happening more so across all of these agencies, particularly with our black and brown BIPOC communities, more still needs to be done and more and the issue is that it needs to be more deliberate and happening at the initial level before like the rules come out, before announcements are made, our communities need to be engaged and our leaders need to be engaged because they have insights that can be helpful for this work. Um, some of the other things that we've been doing are trying to get more activists involved in this space, particularly through our artivist work. So as mentioned at the top that, you know, the Hip Hop Caucus, which uh, again is in our 20th anniversary, has many relationships with artivists who are, you know, trying to become more engaged. And the EPA itself has done some of this work with its NEAC, the National Environmental Youth Advisory Council, and some of those same people overlap. And what we want to do is make sure is that those folks, particularly younger people, have the opportunity to be engaged in this more nitty gritty policy work that is actually the things that are going to change the future for millions of people around the country. Thank you, Russ. That was very thorough. I have just a real follow up question in terms of you. Um, that sounds exciting about the champions in um, on the Hill. What about with your, your youth? Is, do you have a specific youth core? And how do you re recruit youth to be leaders mm -hmm. to actually go out and, and speak on behalf of their communities? Well, so here's the amazing thing about the youth. They don't need to be recruited. It's particularly today. Like they already have a voice and particularly within the age of cell phones, Zoomers, uh, next up is Generation Alpha. They're already leaders on their own. What we try to do is give them the platform as Hip Hop Caucus platform, also in support to amplify their work and what they're doing. We've done some, like I mentioned before, some of them who have their own platforms from trying to make the connections for them to the more concrete uh, policy leaders in these spaces. And so that they can speak more to some of these issues that they already feel passionate about, particularly around environmental justice. Uh, again, as I mentioned, like EPA started doing this, but there's ways like to make these connections more deliberate. 
uh, something else that we do, whether they're artivist people like Big Wind Driver, Green Girl Leah, Christy, who's Brown Girl Green Drutman, uh, Wawa Gathiru, who runs Black Girl Environmentalist, which has its own chapters across the country now. Um, these are all people who are within, who are also within our own network and doing great work on their own. And so we don't see them as like someone who is like uh, underneath us. They are partners with us in this work in terms of driving and creating a larger umbrella of BIPOC environmental advocates who care about environmental justice and understand that we don't get climate justice and these climate environmental wins without focusing on environmental justice communities. Thank you, Russell. So I think we're going to have one more question for Dar, and then we'll be going to our audience. So Patrick, back yeah, to you. Definitely. That was a really great um, answer, Russell. And this, this last question is for Dar and Russell. So I'm um, looking forward to both of your answers. But looking ahead, what role EPA, but not just EPA, because I know there's definitely others on the call from um, local, um, state, and uh, regional and nonprofits. Um, so what can EPA and organizations like EPA do in fostering more inclusive and equitable, equitable environmental spaces, both within the agency and it's an engagement with external stakeholders? Um, so I'd definitely love to hear both your perspectives on that. Um, can we go to Star, please? Okay. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I feel like uh, um, what I see are, you know, there are vulnerabilities. I just see places, you can just see it. You just, you, you walk into places, there are places where you can find a good cup of coffee and places where you can't find, you know, a, a, a sidewalk that, you know, and um, so I think that the EPA needs to, really needs to keep on doing its good science work, getting that out into the world to let us know what the new science is and what the new information is, because there's a lot of disinformation out there. And then uh, also, you know, find the translators of that information. And then also just create, um, just make sure that, that the scaffolding is in place for fairness and justice, because what we've seen, and I know the EP, I'm sure it drives you crazy, but, you know, it's like, uh, there's something that I call positive proximity, which is this experience in communities that you can feel in the air where people recognize that living side by side with one another is beneficial. And, and what that creates is a sense of people who can interconnect with each other and find solutions and see, you know, bad developers coming over the hill and say, wait a minute, you know, let's put the brakes on that. We have standards. We have standards for air, water, earth. And somebody said, who, who wouldn't want positive proximity? And I said, the people who want to drive the biggest bulldozers down a main street possible. You know, the more disconnected people are, the bigger the bulldozer can come in to do big projects that make big money, that ignore people, large populations in a really big way. And I feel like the EPA is at its best when it's looking out for places which for various reasons, economic, systemic racism have been vulnerable and, and that you know are on the, the radar of big bulldozers. Um, and that's what I loved about the underwater projects clip that you just showed. You know, it's that positive proximity, that community is forming, but it's already vulnerable because of what's happening to it environmentally. So you you so you have the social cohesions that's happening. So create the linking capital that brings together that wonderful social cohesion that's happening culturally and in you know, towns and, and cities. Give it extra power, amplify those things so, so that we are truly a fair country. We don't have these vulnerable spots where the big bulldozers and the big pollution and the big problems can go. No, thank you. Thanks for that, Dara. Russell. Would you like to add to that, your perspective? Sure. sure. I, I commented on some of it already in terms of like what EPA could be doing and what EPA is actually already doing, um, like through the NEAC. Um, some other opportunities I think that could piggyback off of is, you know, utilizing the you know, funding that's come down from the climate court for the climate corps and being more involved in getting, you know, young people, people who are interested in being in environmental justice 
directly involved into the work of the EPA and being like the next generation. I mean, let's make no mistake, like the Environmental Protection Agency was created. It's a, you all are, it's a social justice organization. It's like a branch of government. It was there to focus on like the aspect of civil rights that are in our environmental justice rights for the country. And so I think leaning into that and doing events like this that give the public more access and understanding of what the agency is doing, particularly across the different regional offices, this is a great, these are great opportunities right here and helping to give opportunity to amplify, you know, other additional new voices across generations who understand this work and will want to be involved in this work so that they can learn from each other. Thanks, Russ. Thanks for the acknowledgement. Um, our, here at the region, we're really our emphasis and with our regional administrator is to be in the field and engage. So this virtual summit with right now, we've got like 500 participants in this session is our way of being in the field and in touch with folks because it's kind of difficult when you're sitting at a desk. So we just getting out there. So thank you for, for raising that point. Um, I think we want to go to the audience now. Um, to see if there's anything in the chat. Yes, so we have about six questions. <laughs> so I don't know how okay. much time we have left right. um, with our speakers, but um, could try to summarize um, two of them where um, this is from Sabrina Rhodes and John Foran. Um, the question is, how can we incorporate lyrics and music to help all generations, especially those in our EJ communities, make us understand how to feel and help them understand about EJ, the impact it's having on us? And then the follow-up is, um, from John, is uh, because music is such a powerful medium um, to move and influence people, do you feel like there's sufficient uh, momentum from your fellow artists in joining you on this journey? Russell, do you want to start? I, I was going to actually say if you wanted to start and then I'll uh, piggyback off of it, it's fine. <laughs> okay. I, um, I mean, I would continue, you know, um, I will always advocate for um, creating things that are participatory. So bringing in lyrics is, as, as I said, I mean, I've, I've seen, I opened for John Baez for like a year and I watched people who, you know, like they had been hippies in the 60s and they're wearing suits now. And I watched them become, you know, that that person that they had been in 1968. So I, I am I'm all for how lyrics can um, be brought in. And, and I think they are actually very effectively. Um, but I think um, if they're festivals, you know, sort of large music events, are really wonderful ways to piggyback on different things. At my concerts, I try to do it more and more, get people to table at my events. We used to have a thing where a person would come up and speak for a minute, and we were like, believe me, a minute is a long time on the stage. And they would come up and just deliver. And so, you know, bringing together arts and events um, and figuring out how the, we can kind of bring the two together on a regular basis, I think would be, um, and being innovative and crafty about it, I think is, is what I would recommend. And if there, you know, I oftentimes have had such a bad time, like inviting environmental organizations to sponsor concerts that I just say, you know what, I'm going to book the concert. I'm going to go into the thing. You just have like the wine reception or the special seating or the meet and greet, because, you know, but I don't know if there's a way that, that, government agencies like the EPA could sponsor um, music events. You'd really, it's, it, it would be helpful because musicians have a hard time, um, uh, you know, ever since the streaming has gone in, it's been a real transition, a real base of income disappeared. And, you know, as, as people say, I'm one sprained vocal cord away from my livelihood because of that. So there's a lot of vulnerability amongst artists. So if there's a way to, to support them um, with events or, or in some way, um, you know, financially, so that it can be part of their livelihood, I think, you know, off the top of my head, that's a, that's a thought that I would have um, too. I would also maybe go to artists because I, I, a lot of my friends are like, yeah, I just don't do like the environment thing. I don't do the political thing. It's like, we're, we're all part of ecosystems, social systems. And so, 
pressing <laughs> artists a little more on kind of, you know, not do you engage, but how do you engage? Um, I think is something that I try to do with my fellow artists. Like we're in it, man. I mean, we're culturally in it. So like, how can you be part of being in it uh, in a way that feels comfortable to you? Yeah, I would just piggyback off of that. Uh, a few points that Dar made. Um, one, there are definitely connections in terms of like lyrics and like anyone who's interested. I mean, like utilizing your own voice or like thinking about lyrics, like big major artists talk about climate and environmental change actually more often than people realize. Billie Eilish, Childish Gambino, both of them have been like very like vocal about their stances on all sorts of social justice issues, including the environment. Um, and But there's actually more, and particularly for us as we think about hip hop artists, there's a lot more activism than people give credit for amongst like artists. It's actually something that I'm working on right now in terms of identifying and pushing out like the fact that it's not just artists from back in the day, that there are current artists now who still care about and actually do push for environmental change in their lyrics. Um, there's definitely ways to participate. For example, you know, we're on the 10 year anniversary of our uh, home album that featured, you know, artists like Raheem Devon and Common and L. Varner, you know, speaking to some of these issues, particularly, you know, like water issues that came up around the Flint water crisis, but other environmental justice issues. And I think there are, you know, some ways that, you know, government uh, can, can have natural partnerships uh, with artists, whether it's, you know, like at events, you know, festivals like One Music Fest in Atlanta, uh, places like that, where you can bring together the people who are attending that conference, who want to learn more about like these issues, and then also having the art, giving the artists a platform for themselves to speak to the issue, or, you know, similar to what Dar said about like having, you know, groups come up and be able to speak at these events and like, you know, give their spiel as, you know, whether it's the administrator or you know, other folks who are like, they're just happy to be there. In fact, I remember, I think last year or two years ago, uh, there is uh, a local festival here in D.C. where I'm based called Broccoli City, where Administrator Regan actually came and spoke and gave like a fireside chat to uh, some of the conference attendees there. And so I do think that there are you know, natural fits for ways to get, you know, government and government officials and just and advocates more involved with the uh, artists and music and the uh, music industry and music attendees. Uh, and vice versa. Wow. Patrick, I'm really glad that this is being recorded because this is such good stuff. And we're being told that we have to, to end. Um, but you guys were just absolutely amazing. And we were just honored that you were able to come and speak with us today. We could probably go on and on. And, you know, I'm sorry that we don't have much time, but Thank you so much. Uh, you, your responses were just spot on and just really supportive. Um, Russell, I wish the best for you with this Essence, Essence Festival. We're going to try to see if we can connect with your group when you say talk about an event. And Dar, thank you so much for your advice and recommendations. And we will also, again, probably pull you. Um, you know, we saw you uh, nationally with our deputy administrator, but. Um, we're just appreciated, very appreciative of the support um, that you've shown. And I'm sure our audience is just tickled. We're getting all these hearts and, and hand claps. So Patrick, I think we're done. So yeah. you thank you say, all. Put me to work. <laughs> okay. All right. Do that.